I could not be more honored to be here and sit with this panel, who I think is about as well equipped globally as well as here in the region to talk about where the money is and where it's going overall. Just as a very quick framing, uh, I never recommend and I never read business books, but I just read one which I urge you to get. It's by James Gleick, and it's called The Information. And what it really is effectively is the history of information, how information revolutions have come over the years, so the dawn of writing, printing press, telegraph, telephone. And one of the most remarkable things that makes me think a lot when I'm here is that in every instance of every revolution in information and sharing of information, most of the people at the time summarily rejected it. Everyone, for the most part, thought this was meaningless. In fact, throughout history, the most common question people would ask, who would ever use this stuff? I've got no purpose for any of the inventions that have ever happened before. So it's surprising at one level that it's so consistent in that way, but therefore it is unsurprising to me today that so many people are failing to appreciate this diffusion of innovation that is happening around the world today because people around the world today have got in their hands the ability to create, collaborate, and affordably scale businesses in ways that were unimaginable even five years before. And even more mind-blowing to me, as a couple of people have alluded to here, is we are in the earliest, earliest days. Most of the problems that I've heard people talk about here, I don't think we're going to be talking about in three years overall. The ramifications are incredible. I was in Cairo a week ago, and the Vodafone guys showed me this $45 uh, smartphone, which they deployed in Kenya, and 400,000 people grabbed it in the first month. And when you stop to think about a world where most people, or at least a large number of people, have computing devices on the person, we can't even begin to imagine the ramifications of not only business opportunities, but where things are going to happen overall. I hear the debate about whether or not, in MENA in particular, people should be focusing on Me Too copycats, whether they should be focusing on local problem solving, whether they should be focusing on new global initiative. And frankly, to me, it's a moot question. The answer is yes, all three. And all of this is going to come very powerful. The debate about what's going to be the next hub of innovation in places like MENA, the next Silicon Valley, for lack of a better word, to me is also irrelevant overall, because I think what we're seeing is networks of hubs of innovation and great product development, which has huge ramifications for the kinds of things that we will be looking at as investors. Peter Thiel, who's a well-known venture capitalist from the United States, controversial guy, provocative guy, but track record speaks for itself. When he talks to his investments and when he talks to his management teams, he encourages them to think about what he calls unobvious connections. Keep looking for unobvious connections. For the people in this room, for this panel, for me, I hope, everything I've just talked about is in fact very obvious. But what is stunning, not unlike the book I described to you, is in so much of the world right now, it is unobvious. And because of that, I think the opportunity is of historic proportion. This is an unobvious panel. These guys think in a new kind of way. And I'm going to ask them to talk to us a little bit about investing, generally speaking, uh, in the globe and in the world. And of course, because of the nature of our gathering, we'll talk about e-commerce. Palmer, I'd like to start with you, if I could. Uh, VC head at Hummingbird Ventures. You've got great successes under your belt as one of the guys who found Peak Games. You know the region well. You're very involved in Marca VIP. You spend much of your, your career in mobile, really, as kind of a pioneer of it. And you're about to move to Turkey. So you've got a really interesting insight over this, and I wonder if you could give me just a general purview of how you're thinking about investing in different corners of the world in MENA right now overall. Thanks, Chris. So I think an obvious connections is a, a good summary of uh, why, why I'm here in, in MENA at the moment. You know, I, I grew up in France, lived in the U.S. for a couple of years, worked there, moved to the U.K., and spent the last 10, 12 years in the U.K., first as an entrepreneur with a, a startup that was, you know, we had an exit, but it wasn't a fantastic exit. We didn't really make money out of it uh, because we had investors who had preference shares and so on. And so by the time we exited, we, we didn't, as founders, didn't really make money. And, and then I, I continued in, in the, um, uh, let's say, entrepreneurship space in the UK, getting involved in various companies um, as, a, as, a, as a small investor. Um, and I also founded another company later. But overall, when I look at the, the 10, 12 years I've done that in, in the UK, at least, you know, I can't name any one big success out of those 10 years. Uh, it was fun. It was an interesting journey. I think as people say, experience is what you get when you didn't get what you want. And so talking about unobvious connections, um, uh, you know, I, I had a personal interest in Turkey because my parents are Turkish. I mean, I'm Turkish too, but I, I grew up outside Turkey. 
And I started looking at doing uh, small investments in Turkey out of my pocket. So I, I, I did one or two. And, uh, and then I, I loved what I saw. I loved the energy. And every time I, I go to Istanbul, and I think it's still true today, I feel like my clock speed goes up by two or three times versus London. You know, when you call somebody in Istanbul at midnight, they pick up and they don't act offended or they don't think something is wrong with you or you had an accident or something. It's normal. Um, everything goes faster. Decisions get made faster. And I just love that. I love that energy. Uh, I think maybe in Europe, I don't know why, maybe because of demography, you know, people are older. Uh, because maybe we're richer in Europe, I think we've lost a little bit of that energy. And that's what I love about this region as well. So regarding, uh, regarding me now, I mean, that, that was a completely unobvious, complete uh, unobvious connection. I had really zero experience of the MENA region other than going to Egypt a couple of times for work um, seven years ago. And one day, uh, uh, Ahmed Al Khatib contacted me over LinkedIn. So it's like online dating. He found me on LinkedIn. And my initial reaction was, you know, should I even take this seriously? You know, who's this guy? I don't know who this guy is and so on. But when I, and I saw his profile, I was, I was really excited because here was someone who had spent 12 years in Silicon Valley and more importantly, he had spent five years in, um, in a very strong e-commerce company called Zazzle where he was a fourth employee. And one thing I had learned from my two years um, in Turkey was that it was very difficult to find entrepreneurs with that kind of caliber who knew e-commerce and had, um, had senior roles in e-commerce companies before, particularly in the US. Uh, so I came to Jordan a week after he contacted me on LinkedIn. We had a few Skype calls first, and I thought, you know, he was a really smart guy, knew what he was talking about. Um, I met him. I met some of the folks that he was uh, hoping to, 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 to launch his venture with. And I, you know, I, I, was, I was blown away. I was really blown away by the quality of the guys and, and by the opportunity. And um, I also knew from my experiences in Turkey, unsuccessfully trying to invest in Trendyol. Um, for, well, first of all, when Demet started, I didn't believe in it. So she was looking for angel investors. I was like, nah, you know, you've got Mark Afoni and all these other guys, forget it. You've got no chance. And, and then when she started taking off, then, um, you know, other investors came along and paid a lot more money. So we, we missed out. And um, so I was a bit of a frustrated e-commerce investor, let's say. And so when I met Ahmed and I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity in this region uh, to do something similar, uh, that's really how we got started. Um, so unobvious connections, but um, now I'm, I'm a complete convert to the opportunity in this part of the world. I feel like probably, you know, the, well, the feeling I have here is probably the feeling that some people must have had in Silicon Valley, you know, 15 years ago, 13 years ago. Um, and I feel there's a, a wonderful opportunity over the next two to three years to build a number of uh, large companies, not just in e-commerce, but in digital media. And, you know, for us, you know, Obviously, we're looking at opportunities to leverage the size of this local market. So maybe to take concepts that are proven elsewhere and do them here. But we're also looking for companies that can have a global impact. And I think it's possible to do that. Um, Peak Games is probably another example of, of one of our investments, which um, while right now is focused primarily on Turkey and uh, Arabic-speaking countries, so the, the Middle East, um, has certainly ambitions to go beyond that and has the capabilities to go beyond that. Now, Sidar, the, the founder of Peak Games, um, is a serial entrepreneur. He built and sold four companies before he started Peak. Some he sold successfully, some were disasters. Um, but he has phenomenal experience. And that's, again, something that is quite rare in Turkey. Um, and all these companies were either in gaming or digital media. What, what, um, have you seen in, what, what have you seen in entrepreneurs here? In 30 seconds or less, what do you look for in 30 seconds or less when you meet these guys and women for the first time? What jumps out at you, particularly for this kind of a region? I mean, what we look for, I think, is probably the same as everywhere else. So we look for integrity. We look for fast execution, so capability to work really fast and be really aggressive. Um, we look for people who um, have a worldview, um, you know, understand best practice from, from everywhere. Um, and typically, we look for people who have had a few failures as well. Awesome. Because failures are great to... So, ver success. So, so very quickly, if you call somebody in Jordan at midnight, do they answer? I'm sorry, say that again? If, so, if you call somebody at midnight, like you said in Turkey, will you get an answer? Well, uh, Ahmed calls me at 2 in the morning, so, um, and I answer as well. Not, not always, but usually. Maybe not 8 in the morning here, but 2 in the morning would be good. <laughs> <laughs>